First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank our panelists for being here with us today. I want to introduce you all to Alberto Amore, Assistant Professor at the University of Oulu in Finland, and Valeria Pecorelli, PhD researcher of geography at the Faculty of Arts Tourism. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you here. Together with them, we are going to discover how the travel industry is transforming towards responsible and sustainable practices. And we're going to see some case studies that have reconciled sustainability, luxury, and environmental preservation. You also have the possibility to interact with our speakers and ask them questions. And talking about that, I'd like to remind you that after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where you'll be able to ask direct questions to the panelists. So don't be shy and just type all of your questions in the Q&A section here in Zoom, and we'll go through them at the end of the webinar. Also, for those of you interested in receiving a certificate of attendance by Doxity for this free masterclass, stay tuned because we will post the link to, the, to get the certificate at the end of the session. So I think that we are able to start now. Welcome to those who just joined us. And without further ado, I'm now leaving the floor to our panelists for their presentation. Thank you so much. Enjoy and see you later. Hello, nice to meet you. I am Valeria Picorelli. I am a geographer working at Hume University. I lecture in um, uh, the hospitality and management uh, uh, master degree. Um, and tonight, um, I hope to entertain you with um, pretty fascinating case studies that um, are the Maldives. So um, just a minute. So as you can see from this picture, uh, Maldives are always a good idea if you're looking for the tropical dream, a uh, perfect, uh, pristine uh, environment, white beach, uh, blue water, uh, some lush greenery. And um, of course, um, also some luxury and uh, um, untouched uh, contact with nature. Um, we uh, in academia believe that uh, luxury and sustainability, as uh, already anticipated, um, have become tools, well, key tools, I would say, in the tourist um, industry to, um, let's say, combine uh, the perfect vacation and uh, the protection of fragile environments, especially in uh, island settings. And uh, as you can see here, the Maldives. Uh, a couple of years ago, celebrated the Jubilee, and they have become the perfect example, the perfect model for um, tourism industry to uh, provide a perfect holiday and uh, um, conservation of biodiversity and preservation environment. It's, the Maldives are described as a place of dreams um, that have been chosen by couples, honeymooners for romantic vacations, but they also um, are quite uh, keen on fulfilling almost all expectations of holidays for families, for sporty people. Uh, but of course, uh, being so uh, remote and uh, fragile, um, they are subjected to a number of um, uh, risks and uh, hazards. And for these reasons, uh, for example, here, the Lonely Planet suggests that you really should visit now before it's too late. One of the first problem that is um, argued regarding fragile environments and small islands, uh, it's about the rising sea levels. But unfortunately, we will see in a couple of slides that this is not just the only problem. So um, in contemporary tourism, uh, the island resort model um, built to meet the tropical dream expectations of European visitors um, has been represented as a well-established tourist model for some destinations such as the Maldives or um, Fiji Islands or Mauritius, many islands in, uh, in tropical um, areas. Here also you can see an example of what is considered a uh, uh, luxury tourism offering um, uh, this uh, rare experience of luxury 
um, combined with the respect of the environment. Uh, and this is so because it, it, it claim, they claim to be self-sufficient uh, from the food uh, provision for energy, um, because as you can imagine, these small islands just produce coconuts because they are basically sand islands with some palms. You don't grow much on, on, on sands, of course. And um, they have tuna, they have fish, so the, 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 which is also the second industry in the Maldives. So the first industry is tourism, the second industry is uh, fishery. They are highly dependent on the import um, trade. They import, they import, of course, any kind of goods, apart from, of course, tuna and coconuts. And uh, for these reasons, tourism islands, such as resort islands, um, need to become uh, self-sufficient or to be, become just super dependent on other countries, on other systems. As you can imagine, it's not easy to manage um, a, a huge amount of tourists with uh, a good ec with uh, expectations, feed them nicely with healthy food, providing them with the best um, holidays ever. And for these reasons, for example, Soneva, but also other resorts um, have organized themselves in order to um, try to be creative and innovative at the same time and to support biodiversity. And as you can see in this picture, there is a kitchen garden where basically they grow uh, most of the food they serve um, on the tables in these uh, beautiful resorts. Of course, someone, some, some of you would argue, but yes, but we have water villas here. How can this be sustainable? Because for building those water villas, for sure, they have somehow uh, transformed or perhaps damaged the reef, the corals there. And yes, this is true, unfortunately, but they also say, I mean, usually these systems try to reuse and recycle woods um, from other parts of the world and try to be, I mean, not 100% sustainable, but the most sustainable that they can. Um, so of, another important thing is that um, when you visit the Maldives, for example, you expect to see corals, colorful corals, healthy corals are colorful. But here, uh, because of a number of different reasons, uh, corals have started to bleach and not just in the Maldives. Um, so what's happening is that uh, um, tourists, but also local people, could be quite disappointed and also worried because of the state of the, of this, of the, of the corals. And uh, the biodiversity is no longer so uh, interesting and uh, perhaps uh, tourists may lose interest as, as well, so not a decide to choose another destination. And for this reason, um, the first tourist master plans um, have decided to address the problem. And the industry, the tourist industry is well aware that they need to manage sustainable tourism in order to preserve the environment that can be uh, enjoyed by the local communities. Um, and from uh, and for the the tourist community, um, and so it is a must for these resorts for the tourist industry to prefer to preserve the unique appeal of the tourism, which is basically uh, the marine ecosystems. Uh, this problem is also pretty shared in Australia, for example, and perhaps Dr. Amore, that spent some times in that latitude of the world. For his yeah. studies, would like to uh, add but, something. By all means, uh, and in regards to the Great Barrier Reef, that's the site we we're talking about. Uh, uh, for those who do not know, that area has been uh, affected severely by coral bleaching uh, and uh, the intrusive uh, tourism uh, and scuba diving activities. Uh, uh, one of the uh, issues that can be directly attributed to uh, diving, scuba diving in those areas is the use of specific uh, sun lotions that eventually can be hurtful for the very fragile marine ecosystem and the coral reefs. Attempts and ways to uh, reinforce and strengthen the uh, few remaining corals in there have been adopted, uh, 
Uh, this is a practice that uh, combines biomarine bio marine sciences and efforts that uh, not only have been applied to Australia, but also to a larger extent across the Maldives themselves with initiatives of the kind, but also in the Caribbean, um, on the islands of uh, um, um, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, and uh, not least uh, the Rivera May in Mexico. The latter one is actually an interesting case because uh, instead of being a situation caused by coral bleaching or acidification of the seas, this was a, a post-disaster, post-hurricane effort to reinforce uh, uh, the better and the accessibility to uh, the, the coast uh, in the border between uh, Belize and Mexico. So, Yeah, thank you. It's, it, it's as you can see, uh, so academia is pretty aware of this problem and so it's trying to address it and of course we have the climate crisis, the environmental problems but also the impact of tourism and other industries so uh, we must be really attentive to see uh, the consequences of these and of these uh, effects and try to 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 preserve the, the environment. Uh, also, the industry in the Maldives specifically here is pretty aware the of the fact that uh, they have a most fragile ecosystem. But this is it's because it's so unique and fragile that it, it's the reason why it attracts millions of travelers from all around the world. So uh, the industry um, it has, has started to uh, include in some resorts um, marine biologists, to educate um, not just the tourists, the, the tourists, but also, well, the tourists, and then I will tell you later how they do. It's an, in a fun way, of course, but also managers and people working in, in the industry. So if people are aware and are educated, they can also contribute uh, little by little to look after the environment. And so going back to the environmental crisis and the Maldives, as I told you before, are, are not so un, unspoiled and untouched. They look pristine and, uh, you know, this, this idea we have, especially in Europe, of uh, the paradise on uh, Earth. But unfortunately, they have a waste management issue. Um, they also have... Uh, uh, another problem is linked to microplastics. Here on the bottom, you can see I reported a couple of studies um, that shows the distribution of microplastics, not just around the reef, the corals, but also around the inhabited islands and on the beach where resorts are. So when you in some areas, you may swim in a beautiful blue water, but it's somehow contaminated by microplastics. And this is something that is, has been addressed and it's been addressing. Um, and according to other scholars, uh, the paradise is not so quite a paradise because uh, from an environmental point of view, the Maldives government uh, could do more and they basically are doing uh, to um, manage a number of issues such as sewage and also the, the waste management. Because as you can see, uh, in, in here, this uh, smoky um, picture, that's uh, basically the, it's called the, the rubbish islands. It's the island where uh, all the waste is collected and basically burned and the fumes are toxic. So how can we uh, address this problem? Shall we uh, perhaps invest, first of all, producing less waste, less plastic and the tourist industry is somehow um, guilty of that <laughs> uh, because it's highly consuming. It's an industry that it's highly consuming in terms of plastics and disposable um, items. But again, so they are really trying to uh, fix all these problems. And um, also another problem is the way that the fact that corals for, for many, many years has been used as traditional uh, material to construct uh, buildings nowadays is um, no longer possible it's um, it's forbidden but uh, in order to reach these beautiful tropical dreams for our holidays uh, some corals have been uh, removed and so that's also another problem at the same time as also Alberto has suggested there are programs of restoration and conservation of corals 
corals um, is an animal. And so they grow corals uh, together with this, um, in collaboration with some with the scientists. And uh, sometimes they also um, involve tourists. And this is the fact, this is the example of the diamonds uh, to the Fushi Maldives. I uh, researched this case study with the uh, PhD student of mine, and together then uh, with other scholars, we published um, a couple of articles related to this. Um, what they do here, as you can see, it's also another beautiful luxury resort uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, we all we would all like to be here, especially if you are in a, in a cold environment as us at the moment. Perhaps Professor Amore more than me, because I am in Milan in Italy. It was like a zero degree today, but he lives in Finland at the moment, so it's pretty freezing. And so here, going back to our tropical dream here, what they, what they um, promote, uh, it's beach cleanings and coral conservation project together with the um, biology, marine biology lab workshops to educate uh, tourists, trying to involve them and informing them uh, regarding all the marine environmental issues. Um, and the fact that they, the, the added value of this experience is the feel good factor, of course, and the fact that they when go back home, they are well aware that what they do uh, back home could somehow in, impact, be impactful on the environment and even on fragile environments and ecosystems such as small islands. Uh, of course, here we um, organize a number of interviews, focus groups, and the feedback uh, we had from um, the guests and from the manager was pretty encouraging. And so let's hope that this could be somehow uh, a good idea to, to share also with other um, resorts. Um, in literature, uh, researching a fragile environment, especially on small islands, there is this idea of um, this concept of resort effect. The fact that um, tourist islands may act as a refugee for coral reef species. So it means that, uh, sorry, species. Uh, so it means that uh, um, because uh, you have a resort and uh, you have tourists there that are educated and uh, have speci specific rules to follow, um, no, uh, no uh, fishing activities are allowed and all other uh, harm, harmful activities are allowed there. And so um, somehow the resort becomes a sort of marine, indirectly marine um, protected area. And uh, inspired by this concept, we have thought that perhaps we may uh, announce this, this idea with a, another concept, which is the new resort effect. And your new resort effect is linked to the idea that perhaps uh, tourists can help to care for marine and coastal protected areas of small islands, informing and training people regarding uh, the fact that the marine space belongs to everybody. So uh, Mediterranean people are not really keen on the idea of ocean because we believe that ocean is something really far away from us. But again, the Mediterranean Sea is part of a larger sea. And so the also, this idea of ocean literacy, the fact that you are you become educated um, in terms of uh, what's important uh, for the sea um, health, uh, the fact that the sea provides oxygen, provides a number of uh, uh, benefits also for our um, life on the earth, and it's not just a recreational uh, environment. And so this is something that is also being uh, pretty important for the um, Agenda 2030. It's goal 14. Bear in mind, because sometimes we may ask you this uh, to some exams if you decide to register with us. Um, so the idea is to uh, try to educate guests in education, in, um, in activities, and uh, try to see if... Uh, uh, um, becoming part, part of the solution may help to solve the problem. Um, so um, I believe that uh, as, as uh, scholars uh, uh, doing basic during studies and geography, we may somehow stimulate, at least scientifically, uh, informed recommendations to build best, best practices in, um, in line with the current academic debate, because 
the idea is to protect the environment in tourism, uh, especially in the cl climate crisis uh, era. And um, in the geography curriculum, we tend to include updated research in order to provide our students with tools, uh, approaches, perspectives to read uh, the contemporary society, uh, the challenges they are facing, um, of course, for their career, but also for the personal life. So I don't know if Dr. Amore would like to, uh, to add something related to uh, this. I have uh, some comments and some observation yes. to back up what uh, Dr. Ooh, Pecorelli was sorry. mentioning, specifically yes. with uh, the United Nations to Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these uh, represent a quite uh, important framework upon which uh, uh, agencies uh, and international level like the United Nations World Tourism Organizations and to a lesser extent uh, the World Travel and Tourism Council define and recommend guidelines on how operators, tourist associations and so forth uh, have to uh, comply and follow the principles of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, uh, actually, there are two dedicated and very clear uh, uh, elements in the UN SDGs that uh, look specifically at tourism. One is uh, UN SDG number 12, uh, Sustainable Production and Consumption, which uh, Sustainable Tourism Production and Experience is central. And the other one relates to uh, quality jobs, uh, so mm. United Nations Sustainable Goal number eight. Because in the end, uh, we are talking about uh, a sector that uh, has had uh, for decades been experiencing quite uh, uh, pervasive and quite exploitative forms of labor. Uh, again, internationally, the International Labor Organization has issued many, many reports advocating sure. for a, a different approach. And this is, has been taken considering, being considered quite extensively internationally uh, among academia. Uh, again, in relation to the climate change, uh, we have members and colleagues here at the University of Olo that are part of the uh, tourism and climate change uh, panel the support that uh, works on an annual basis along with the IPCC. So it is happening and it's uh, the linkages and the implications are, are there. Re whether it is a small island destinations in the case of the Maldives, or a more established uh, uh, urban destination of the magnitude and volume uh, such as London. So we are working on this and there is a dedicated group of scholars, uh, advisors uh, and experts that are uh, willing, given their time, expertise and knowledge to uh, bring a change in the way tourism uh, has been and has occurred uh, to date. Yeah, that's pretty true. I completely agree with you. And in fact, we work together. <laughs> it's not it's not by chance. Uh, there's also another point is that, that with, because of COVID, uh, tourism was really a suff well suffered a lot and many jobs were lost. The industry lost, uh, um, uh, well, not just money, but also energies. And so perhaps um, we, well, that, that period of time, uh, is, especially in academia, was uh, somehow exploited to rethink some, uh, uh, some ways, some, some, some ideas in which uh, tourism was uh, well, sold, conceived, uh, and also studied. And uh, so um, I believe that uh, this approach could be really um, helpful and can perhaps um, also uh, make the, some difference at a certain point, because when you know it's knowledge is power, it's said. So uh, especially uh, in the curriculum uh, we, we teach, it's the sustainable tourist destination curriculum, we have these um, uh, attitude to try to not just to problem uh, problem solving attitude but also a critical thinking so to understand uh how it, how the industry works and uh, i mean it's not because it comes from the industry which it is good it's also to make it better all the time so i don't know if there are some questions from home 
Okay, hello. Um, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, of course, if you want to make some questions to, to our panelists, you still have time, so don't be shy and we will get to you um, as soon as possible. Um, in the meantime, I would like to remind you that um, we are going to send the certificate of attendance to this masterclass by Doxity at the end of the webinar. And um, I don't know if you want to um, tell us uh, something more about uh, Yulm University and maybe the, the specific offerings of the courses, maybe about this specific topic, if you have more information, Valeria. Yes, well, uh, it's a two years degree. Um, the first year is in Milan and you will be given, uh, let's say, uh, a general education related to uh, sustainable geography, uh, management, accounting, um, so the, the world of hospitality and management, while for the second year you have many, many choices. So the first, first choice you have is to stay in Milan and uh, to choose uh, uh, between uh, two basically um, uh, specialization. The first one is uh, more on economic and digital data, while the second one is related to communication and sustainable uh, tourism. Uh, that's an option. Uh, of course, for those who are staying for the second year in Milan, you have the opportunity to have exchange programs, Erasmus programs. We have, uh, if you look on this, uh, the website, uh, you will see uh, all the destinations that are available there. Um, another option is that we have uh, two double degrees. One is in the uh, US, in Florida, with the Rosen College, uh, while the second one, and it's a brand new, is at Yulu University, where Professor Amore works. And here uh, you are going to study um, sustainable tourism, uh, I would say in a northern, <laughs> in a northern environment, uh, with, with a, one of the best uh, department of geographers that uh, are, let's say, superstars in tourist studies, and um, that's also a very good opportunity. Uh, we also have many field works. We have labs. We have um, company visits. Uh, we have small classes. So. The relationship between the students and the lecturers is pretty close. Uh, I wouldn't say like a high school because we come from different experiences, but it's a very friendly uh, environment. You will be asked to work uh, also with your colleagues, with other students. So you will be ready uh, to work with other people. So team working, all the soft skills are pretty much enhanced and developed. Uh, we Every year we have a survey um, in the company where internships are um, carried on by our students and the, we have very excellent feedbacks because our the students that are educated at Yule uh, in these uh, master degrees are really um, uh, smart, I would say, and uh, they can work in a, in, a, in, a, in a, I mean, in a friendly environment, but also under pressure. They are professional, and um, the, the, of course, the, the, the master class is in English, so you will be tested for your English. Um, and I think, uh, well, that's it. We, we have also many professionals teaching for us, and also uh, that um, helps um, seminars. Perhaps I could spend a couple of uh, words for the campus. I'm not, not sure. Yeah, so if you want, I think it's... Yulm is in Milan, which is a vibrant city at the, at the moment. When I used to go, go to university, it was a bit dull. And Alberto Amore agreed with me because <laughs> in the 90s, it wasn't so exciting as today. Um, it, the campus is um, very safe, very quiet um, and green, pretty well organized. We have cafeterias. A canteen. We provide some accommodation, not for everybody, but there is also the possibility to have some accommodations. It's um, easily. Um, uh, it's a, there is a metro, which so it's nicely connected to the rest of the city. So I think it's a nice place to work, 
and uh, and and to and to study. There is also a gym, so that's also the the newest thing. Yeah, good to nice. know. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Keep fit. <laughs> Fantastic. I've seen that um, the students made some questions. So if you want, we can answer them. Um, I don't know if you have any information about these scholarships. Do you know if the Ulm University offers some scholarships to international students? They may offer some scholarships, but for these more uh, technical questions, I would suggest to email the secretary. Uh, there, if you go on the website, mm -hmm. uh, on the HTM hospital and management um, area, uh, you will find all the information, of course. Yes, and they you'll be uh, they will reply to you pretty soon. Fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and I would yeah, like. I, I'm, I I don't do this, uh, but yes, but there there are there are. Yeah, they and I would like to remind you that we will send an email um, after the event uh, with some contacts of the Ulm University so yeah. that you can contact them and uh, ask some more information if you want to uh, to receive to to okay. do specific questions about um, maybe technical aspects or bureaucratic aspects of subscribing at university. Um, another question is, how does uh, Ulm help students support periods abroad at partner universities? Uh, we have Erasmus uh, um, arrangements, agreements. So uh, when you pay the fee, I think it's a money problem here, <laughs> the money question, I'm not wrong. And I think it's the same in Finland, basically, because you pay the fee in, at Ulm University, in the Italian University, you have the access to a partner university of the Erasmus network all around the places. And so that's it. You just it's, it's basically an exchange. I'm not sure if you are uh, provided by some extra money for living abroad. For example, let's say that I'd like to have my Erasmus in Barcelona, which is typical, <laughs> for example. I'm not sure they will give you money, but that's Erasmus. But uh, we have a career uh, service office and the Erasmus office, and you'll be given all the information. They are really, really helpful, very, really supportive and, and kind. So please don't hesitate to email them and ask. Okay, uh, of course. Yeah. I may add to this more for the fact of how the agreement works between all Great. Yeah. And you, uh, <laughs> the tuition fees that you pay at the university in Milan, of course, as part of the double degree, there's no extra fee or any difference that you have to pay for. Uh, when you come here and eventually you decide to opt for the uh, part of the degree, uh, the dual degree here at the University of Olu, uh, all services uh, are provided that are targeted for students. So we have a quite uh, vibrant campus uh, right next to um, mm. cross country skiing, uh, paths, and everything that's running in the green or in the white, depending on what time of the year you come. And uh, everything and all facilities are provided uh, at an advantageous uh, price uh, for uh, students from lunch to accommodations and so forth. Fantastic. And uh, I see here that uh, there's also um, uh, questions more about the topic of today. Okay. Um, one of them is, do you think that we can still have time to do something for the climate conditions? Yeah, that's eco anxiety. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I feel it. Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm, but I'm a very positive person in general. I think so, but we must be aware. I mean, we are, and the, the, your generation is more aware than mine. And uh, the problem, I think, is with people <laughs> over 60 that are uh, ruling the world. But, um, um, well, this is something I, I may share. Like, uh, whenever I teach uh, and I lecture, but I think uh, perhaps I'm, Alberta has the same uh, problem. Uh, my students with this... Uh, and, empowering let's say uh, ideas regarding tourism sustainable tourism to make the difference so an alternative idea of tourism industry perhaps then students said yes but then i go on the, on to the industry on uh, the real life and then they told me yes but we don't have money we don't have time we have to run the hotel i mean that's reality bites somehow okay so it's a matter of changing the formamenti so we say uh, the so uh, don't give up because you may help 
to contribute to change this, um, uh, this problem, this issue. And Alberto More, in particular, yeah. is super expert in climate crisis. Uh, so if we may add, if we would like to reassure our well, students well, here. Well, uh, a few things, and I mean, I, do, I really want to uh, give you uh, a bit of hope in the sense that uh, just the fact that there is an awareness in your generation is a good sign. Uh, your generation among the previous ones are more aware of the environmental implications of travel and how being responsible and having a more environmental behavior is key, regardless of the location on the go. So this element is being come quite center of work that has been conducted here at University of Research Wise uh, with the uh, recently uh, closed initiative uh, focusing on Generation Z. So one of the path was on the uh, global mobilities for uh, travel tourism uh, that uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Sia Maxeke was working on. I still look at the impact uh, of uh, climate change, economic crisis, uh, in the, what has become a more of biodiversity loss and risk of biodiversity disintegrations because of the climate crisis, and climate change. So uh, we are working on this. Uh, your generation is keen to to hear, and I think change will inevitably come also because of the older generations, uh, not say me, colleagues working in New Zealand have done this at the Institute of Future Tourism and know that uh, the trend is there. So there is a change in patterns of consumer behavior, travel behavior, travel preferences, and so on. Yeah, and, and that's why also we, we have tried to find part partners abroad in order to uh, allowed our students also to get in touch with other ideas, other experiences. Um, so I think it's it's possible, difficult, but possible. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is with the course, how we can contribute actively to the environment? I think that's a question about maybe if you have some initiative or something that you organize with the students. Okay, so um, something very interesting regarding our campus and the university is that students whenever um, ask uh, to uh, organize seminars, lab, uh, initiatives are always uh, welcomed. So the students' participation is highly encouraged. And so um, if you have a innovative uh, idea or if you want to organize a seminar or um, to try to provide some um, extra um, recommendations, you are, I think uh, you'll miss the right place. It's You are more than welcome. For example, we, have, we had students um, in the past years that have set up uh, a number of seminars in, um, inviting uh, keynote speakers on specific topics. And they had the rooms, the space, and I think also some money to do that from the Dean. So uh, students' participation is highly, highly encouraged. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question is, what are the professional opportunities by studying master's degree in tourism? Oh, that's difficult. <laughs> well, first of all, um, it depends on your on the specialization. I would say we have managers, we have um, HR uh, experts, we have people who have been work uh, have worked in cooperation in Africa, uh, tourism and cooperation. Uh, there are many many opportunities, um, and also we have a career um, office that helps you to. Um, uh, build your resume, your CV. Uh, it helps um, to uh, for the job interviews with job offers on any kind, and it really uh, try to orientate you to what you feel uh, it's uh, more suitable according to your your previous expertise and the current expertise. So um, from hotel manager to um, I would say uh, HR or also many, many students uh, are working in digital communication for tourism. Uh, food and beverage also, it's, um, it's a department that it's pretty much um, covered. So many opportunities. So, because tourism is not, it's not just tourism, it's also uh, transports, for example, uh, and so on. 
Yeah, okay, there's a plenty of possibility. But if you look on the website, there is the, the, the everything is in detail there. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, also, um, I had this very quickly yeah. some uh, um, complementary spillovers. You might not eventually end up specifically working on hospitality food and beverage, but uh, by having an imprint on sustainability and sustainable related matters, uh, companies are becoming more and more aware of the environmental impact they do. So, uh, large companies have established, uh, as just went by, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility Divisions, in which the element of environment and environmental impact has become central. The degree and the, the expertise we provide actually help to then build in also that the career as a consultant or as an expert that can go from different uh, angles and perspectives uh, and become uh, an independent uh, scholar and expert uh, in the field, which ultimately leads to opportunity to to go places or be present uh, by giving uh, your knowledge and uh, your skills uh, to, to the industry. I'm not sure if uh, you have shared this information, but uh, in a couple of weeks, there are going to be an open day. It's uh, in presence and online. So all the information, all the details will be given. So perhaps uh, it could be interesting uh, for you to register for it. I think, if I'm not wrong, it could, uh, should be on the 22nd of February, 21st, 22nd of February. So with Professor De Carlo, which is the coordinator of the master degree. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, fantastic. This is useful information. So they may email asking information for the open day, so which it's it, it's there. I mean, it's in a couple of weeks. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think you oh. have uh, already partially uh, answered to the question, but is, is it necessary to have English certifications in order to enroll yeah. in the master's program? Okay. Uh, yes, it is. Um, otherwise, if you don't have a certification, you have a test and you have you can provide the certification later. But again, on the website, everything is written and you can also ask for some, uh, I mean, if you, if you want to share, uh, let's say your um story with your education story with the secretary that you will be given uh the exact the tailor-made uh information for for you for uh, for your case so i would ask them okay okay fantastic um yeah another question related to to today's topic is how do people in maldives uh locals i mean feel mm. the climate changing conditions Oh, so there are some research regarding this. Uh, first of all, well, the first problem related to the environment in the Maldives was uh, the tsunami. They realized that they were really uh, under risks uh, when the tsunami in 2005, if I'm not wrong, uh, hit the Maldives. And since then, uh, I think they have started to develop some uh, curricula regarding to um, the education of uh, being of the environment being a fragile ecosystems. Um, and well, moreover, um, uh, the tourism, uh, it's also the one of the, the first resource. So they need to preserve the environment in order to preserve the economy, but also their life. So they're well aware and are pretty sure that uh, they have uh, added some curriculum uh, in the in the schools. And uh, also this awareness that the industry in the Maldives is um, is uh, uh, showing, it's because on a higher level, the governmental level, uh, every three, four, five years, there is a master plan uh, regarding tourism uh, policies. So they try to plan and have strategies and to address all the time the problems and the issues. So it's a, it's a society that I would say it's pretty aware of what's going on. But they also try to um, be... It's trying to be resilient at the same time. Yeah, to react in some ways. Yeah, to react. Yeah, it's a small country, of course, and and it's, it's a scattered because it's an archipelago, so it's all the people is here and there. It's very also from a human, I mean, from a sociological point of view, it's pretty an interesting society, and um, and Male also is the capital. It's a urban, super urbanized city on a small islands, so you have. Uh, it, it's really interesting to, yes. 
And to this, uh, allow me to add, uh, Valeria, on the fact that uh, representatives of the Maldives, as well as representatives of other countries, so called small island nations, have actually gathered forces and worked together in presenting yeah. their voices, their instances at the uh, different COPs, uh, so the events organized by the uh, United Nations International Council for Climate Change. And the latest one took place in Dubai. But there have been some controversies in the way, essentially, uh, their perspective and voices have been silent down recently. But yeah. they are becoming more vocal and we're becoming more aware of the necessity of having the local communities and the, the indigenous communities uh, living in this uh, very fragile ecosystem to have an opportunity to have a future. Because uh, in the end, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the future for uh, all mechanics, for all the people, especially in more. Uh, uh, vulnerable environments. Yeah, there's also a documentary of the president of the Maldives, a past president, also was pretty uh, active in environmental issues that it's denouncing uh, this, uh, this problem. If you look on YouTube or you Google it, you will find it's very, very, yeah, it's very informative. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And I see the last question, uh, that is, if you know if there are any opportunity for crypto technology word with tourism nowadays. Oh, yes, they are. I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer to this because I don't do, I don't do digital stuff, I would say. Yes, but there are. And uh, we also have an artificial intelligence lab at Ulm University. There is a, a group of uh, scholars that are, is uh, working in that field. Uh, we also have some uh, um, uh, professionals coming uh, to present their work in uh, in that area. Yes, of course. Yes, there is. Um, I wouldn't say more than this because it's not my field, it's not my cup of tea. But again, <laughs> for sure. I don't know if Albert is more aware. Perhaps uh, in Finland you work not, on... Not as much, but okay. uh, one of the elements that has been put an accent on is the fact that... Uh, uh, crypto technology, cryptocurrency, NFCs, uh, anything related to like advanced technology or chatbots and AI uh, is, is becoming more and more prominent, uh, especially within the field of uh, uh, global travel and, uh, and hospitality. So the industry is aware of that, uh, the industry is researching on that, uh, and so our universities and scholars that are more than willing and open to share the knowledge we have here a department in marketing that also looks at this element again as part of the agents that yeah. Roger was mentioning before. And uh, so as also Valer mentioned, though, there are uh, people and experts at Yulm that can definitely cover that aspect and uh, tell exactly where the future is heading. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks to our panelists and also thank you to everyone connected today with us. I would like to remind you all of you that if you're interested in receiving the certificate of attendance by Doxity to this masterclass, you can click on the link that I'm sending in the chat right now and request it. Um, so, of course, I hope to see you all again in our next webinar organized by DocCity in partnership with Yulm University. Uh, thanks again to our speakers and everyone connected and have a nice day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Nakdan, as they say in Finland. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.